All right, so here we are in 1.5, and in this section we're going to introduce um, something called elementary matrices. <clears throat> now, um, elementary matrices are are um, connected to the idea of row operations, elementary row operations. So we're going to start by reviewing those really quickly. Um, from uh, section 1.1 and 1.2, we talked about Gaussian elimination and how you can use these three operations to put a matrix in row echelon or reduced row echelon form. Um, those three operations are multiplying a row by a non-zero scalar C, interchanging any two rows, or we can add a constant C, a non-zero constant, times one row to another row. And uh, by this point you will have done lots of practice with that, doing uh, Gaussian elimination. Now, let's suppose for a moment that you were doing Gaussian elimination, you were going through and using these row operations, and you decided, oh, I made a mistake. I'd like to reverse that last step that I did, that I just did. Obviously, you could erase that step if it's on paper, but let's think of it in terms of row operations. Is there a way to perform another row operation on your matrix that will bring you back a step or undo whatever you just did? And the answer is yes. So for example, if you multiplied a row by a non-zero scalar C and you decided I didn't want to actually do that, if you were to multiply that exact same row by the reciprocal of C, it will undo that step, right? Um, similarly, if you interchange any two rows and uh, decide that you want to undo that, you can just interchange the same two rows again and it'll put them, ba put them back in their original positions. Um, and finally, and you may have to convince yourself of this one, it's not too hard to see why this is true, but if you added a constant C times one row to another, then take the same row that you multiplied C to, but this time multiply it by negative C and then add it to that second row again, and it will remove the result of the uh, original step. So basically what this is to say is that any one of these elementary row operations is reversible or invertible by another row operation. And so we call those these three right here inverse operations because they'll undo any one of these three uh, operations up here. Okay, <clears throat> now, uh, let's see, so, um, what, if we if we carry this out for more than one step, basically what this means is that if you perform any number of row operations on some matrix A, getting you to a matrix B, then there's another sequence of row operations, the inverse of all the ones that you just did, that would bring you from B back to A again. And so we can go back and forth from A to B by using a sequence of row operations. And in that case, we say that matrices A and B are row equivalent, which just means any either of these matrices can be obtained from the other by some series of row operations. That's what that means, okay? Um, now, that we've, now that we've gotten some of that terminology out of the way, let's talk about what an elementary matrix is. So an elementary matrix is any matrix that you can obtain by performing one and only one row operation on an identity matrix. So here's some examples right here. Let's take this one. This matrix can be obtained from the two by two identity matrix by multiplying the first row by two. That's one row operation performed on an identity matrix. This one here, it's a four by four matrix, and it looks similar to the identity, but the ones are in the wrong order. Notice that if you swap the second and fourth rows, you'll get back to an identity matrix. So this was obtained by taking the four by four identity matrix and interchanging rows two and four. Um, here, uh, this almost looks like an identity matrix, except for that negative four. If you took the three by three identity matrix, multiplied the third row by negative four, and added that to the second row, you would have obtained this. So any of these three can be obtained from an identity matrix after performing one row operation. And we call these elementary matrices. As you can see, because there's three row operations, there are three types of elementary matrices. Um, so... This theorem here is going to reveal the importance of elementary matrices. If E is any elementary matrix, and A, uh, or sorry, if A, if E is an elementary matrix, and A is a matrix such that this product is defined, E times A, and the order here is important, the elementary matrix is on the left, that matters, um, then 
the product, EA, is the same matrix that you would get from simply performing whatever row operation we got E from on A directly. So this theorem, we're not going to prove this because it, we'd have to prove all three cases, you know, one for each type of elementary matrix. And it's lengthy and kind of cumbersome. It's actually easier if we simply do an example to illustrate this in action. So here's a couple of matrices. This is the uh, a three by two matrix A, and we want to multiply it on the left by this elementary matrix. We know that this is an elementary matrix because it's obtained from the identity by adding three times the third row to the first row. And what we want to do is after performing this product, we want to confirm the theorem that we just stated. So EA, what is EA? Let's write E, it's one, zero, three, zero, one, zero, 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 one. And then here's A, two, one, negative three, zero, four, two. Okay. So uh, using my dot product notation here or, or idea here, I'm going to dot this row to this column. Notice I have a zero here, so nothing's going to happen to this guy. It's just two times one plus four times three or two. Uh, <coughs> or what did I say? Um, uh, yeah, sorry. Two plus 12 is 14. Okay, and then um, I'm going to do this column, so that's going to be 1 times 1 and 2 times 3. So that's going to be, uh, what did I say, 1 times 1 is 7. Okay, and then we're going to take this column and dot it with this row. Notice the only non-zero entry is the 1 here, which will pair up with this negative 3, just giving me negative 3 again. This column I can dot with this row. Again, the only non-zero entry is 1 times 0. That should be 0. And then here, if I dot this column with this row, 1 times 4 is the result. This column with this row, 1 times 2 is the result. Now compare this with A. Okay, So A, if you look at A, the, these two rows are the same. The only thing that's changed is the first row of A and this new row of EA. And again, remember what we said E was. E was the result of multiplying row 3 of the identity matrix by 3 and then adding it to row 1. Well, if I were to take row 3 of A and multiply it by 3 and then add the result to this top row, 3 times 4 is 12, plus 2 is 14. 3 times 2 is 6, plus 1 is 7. So that shows that, it, in this case at least, multiplying by this elementary matrix did the exact same thing as if I just did the operation that got me this elementary matrix on the, in the first place and performed it on A directly. Okay. Now why does this matter? Why is this important? Well, what this is doing is it's establishing a connection between matrix multiplication and elementary row operations which means any question or any problem that involves Gaussian elimination, which is the process of using row operations on a matrix, can be translated into a question about matrix multiplication, multiplying by elementary matrices. And that allows us to start using properties that we already know exist for matrix multiplication. It opens up a whole lot of new doors when we're dealing with augmented matrices, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so going back to the discussion that we initially talked about, remember at the very beginning we said uh, that if you perform an elementary row operation on a matrix, every elementary row operation has an inverse operation that will undo it. What does that translate to now that we're thinking of row operations in terms of matrix multiplication? Well, let's think about this for a second. If E is an elementary matrix, then whatever row operation that we produced or that used that we used to produce it from i can be undone by whatever that inverse operation is so if we let e not be the elementary matrix corresponding to that inverse operation then that would imply that e not times e will reverse what got us e from i and take us back to i again we could similarly show 
that if we did the multiplication in, a, in the reverse order, we would still get i. So what does that actually mean? Well, that means for any elementary matrix, or if e is any elementary matrix, then e is guaranteed to be invertible. Because in this case, e naught would be its inverse. And not only that, the inverse is whatever matrix we would get by performing the inverse operation that got us e on the identity matrix. So let's look at that for a second. We want to find the inverse of this four by four identity uh, elementary matrix. What is this elementary matrix? Where did it come from? Well, this elementary matrix came from in, from uh, interchanging the first two rows of the four by four identity matrix. So how do you undo this operation? Well, you reverse those same two rows. If I want to find the inverse of this, I perform that inverse operation on the identity matrix. But that would look the exact same, wouldn't it? It would look like this. Same matrix. Because again, I want to perform that inverse operation on the identity to produce this uh, elementary matrix here. So this is an interesting example because what it's showing us is that um, this matrix happens to be its own inverse. It's its own inverse. And you can verify that if you want by multiplying these two um, and showing that it gives me the identity matrix. Okay? All right. So this theorem that we're going to talk about here is one of the most important theorems in our book. And it's going to be a theorem that we keep building on. So you'll notice it states that uh, this theorem is, it states it as equivalent statements. Um, so let's talk about what that means for a second. Two statements are said to be equivalent. Let's say that the two statements are P and Q. Two statements are considered to be equivalent if we can say that P if and only if Q. And what that means is if P then Q and if Q then P. Um, now I'm talking in terms of like symbolic logic here. That's the way we usually notate those sorts of things. Um, but what that implies is that basically if these four statements here, A through D, if these statements are equivalent, that's the same thing as saying that if one of them is true, then all of them are true. If one of them is false, then all of them are false. You cannot have some of these being true and some of these being false. We say that that's equivalent because what it actually does is it, in some sense, it gives us an alternative definition for these terms. So let me let me read this really quick, and then we're going to talk about how we prove something like this. If A is an n by n matrix, so it's square, then the following statements are equivalent. A is invertible. That's the first statement. Ax equals zero. Remember, this is a homogeneous linear system in matrix form. Ax equals zero has only the trivial solution. Remember, the trivial solution is when x is a zero matrix. X is a zero vector. The reduced row echelon form of A is an identity matrix. A is expressible as a product of elementary matrices. All four of these are equivalent. Now, why is that useful? Well, one, we've already come across the problem of trying to, lo uh, trying to determine whether a matrix A is invertible. We have a theorem from section 1.4 that shows how to determine whether or not a 2 by 2 matrix is invertible. If whether or not its determinant is equal to zero. Um, but these are, because these are equivalent to the statement that A is invertible, if I can show any one of these, then the others come for free. So for example, if I have a matrix A, if I'm able to show that the reduced row echelon form of A is I, which I can do by just doing Gauss-Jordan elimination on it, then that will imply that A is invertible. So I get that fact for free. How do you prove uh, a theorem like this. Well, one way to do it, let me see if I actually put this graphic on here. No, I, I, I kind of did up here. Let's do this. Um, one way to prove an equivalence theorem where you have multiple statements is to do it in kind of a cyclical pattern. If I can prove if A, then B, and then if I can prove if B, then C, and then if I can prove if C, then D, and then if I can prove if D, then A, that establishes that, uh, that equivalence theorem. Because, for example, if I want to prove that if C is true, then A is true, I can follow this chain of implications here to get there. 
Okay, so in order to do this, we have several parts to show. We have to go through this entire chain here. How do you prove if A is true, then B is true? Well, let's remind ourselves of what A and B are. If A is invertible, then AX equals zero has only the trivial solution. We will assume this and then try to prove this. Okay, so we assume A is invertible to begin with. And now what we're going to do is let X not be any solution of, and this was copied out of the book and they have a typo here. It should say of a x equals zero. Remember, when I'm writing by hand, I'm gonna use arrow notation, but if it's typed, you're gonna see bold. It means the same thing, okay? Um, what we're gonna do here is by assuming that this is a solution, we wanna show that it is in fact the trivial solution, the zero vector. What we can do is use our assumption. We can multiply both sides of this equation here, ax equals zero, by the inverse of a, which would look like this. Now on the left-hand side, if I use my associative property to regroup the product of these first two matrices, A inverse times A, that's equal to I, and I times any matrix is itself. So I times X naught will be X naught. I get X naught on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, any matrix times a zero matrix is a zero matrix. And what that does is it shows that X naught is equal to zero. What that means is if I choose some arbitrary solution to my system, that solution is shown to have to be zero. Therefore, it's the only solution to that system. That establishes B. That's what we're trying to prove with B. So that's one down. We have a few more to go. Um, what's the next thing we want to prove? If B, then C. If AX equals zero has only the trivial solution, then the reduced row echelon form of A is the identity matrix. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, again, we make B our assumption. Let's uh, let AX equals zero have only the trivial solution. That's the assumption that we're making down here. But because we have to do uh, row operations on this, we wanna actually express this system in the larger uh, form like this. So let's suppose this matrix form of our linear system looks like this in its normal form. Okay, now if you perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on this thing, remember this is a square matrix. Uh, the augmented matrix uh, given down here will have a column of zeros put on the end of it, right? Now if you remember, uh, when we did an example uh, <coughs> of... Um, uh, when we did an example of, of reducing a, uh, or using row operations on um, an augmented matrix for a homogeneous linear system, these zeros remain zeros the whole time, right? And now let's go over here. So again, remember what the assumption is. The assumption was that uh, AX equals zero has only the trivial solution, which means that if these are my unknowns, X1, X2, all the way through XN, then x1 has to equal zero, x2 has to equal zero, everything through xn, they all have to equal zero. That's what it means for our solution to be trivial. But how does that translate to the reduced row echelon form of our system, of our augmented matrix? Well, this is what that, uh, this is what that augmented matrix would look like after doing Gauss-Jordan on it. We need our solutions to be x1 equals zero, x2 equals zero, x3 equals zero, and so on, right? Now, if we remove this column of zeros, because that was not part of the original matrix A, we just want the coefficient matrix here, what's left after removing that column is an identity matrix. That's what that looks like. Main diagonal has ones, everywhere else has zeros. And that's what we were trying to prove in the first place. Okay, that establishes the second part. We have two more that we need to show. Let's show that C implies D next. So reminding us, Let's remind ourselves of what that is. C is what we just showed. The reduced row echelon form of A is I. So we're gonna make that an assumption now. A is a square matrix whose reduced row echelon form is I. And we wanna show that A is expressible as a product of, product of elementary matrices. This is where we have that connection between row operations and elementary matrices. So again, let's suppose that you took the matrix A and you performed a sequence of elementary row operations on it to uh, obtain the identity matrix. The assumption C here is the assumption that we can do that. 
that sequence of elementary row operations per being performed on A can be translated into a product of those corresponding elementary matrices on the left by A. So whatever my first row operation I performed on A was, E1A would give me the same matrix. And then if I took that matrix and performed the second elementary row operation on it, then multiplying that by E2 would have given me the same matrix, and so on down the line, right? So as you read from right to left, that gives me the order of those operations. Now, what is it that we're trying to prove? Well, we want to show that A can be expressed as a product of elementary row operations. And remember, every one of these elementary row operations, as we showed in a previous theorem, is invertible. All of them have inverses. So what I can do is start peeling away all of these E's here, all of these elementary matrices, by multiplying on the, on the left, both sides of the equation, on the left, by the appropriate inverses. For example, if I wanted to get rid of that E to the K, I would multiply on the left, both sides, by the inverse of E to the K, which we know exists. And I can keep doing that until I've exhausted all of those elementary matrices. So what does that look like? Well, if you've done that, then uh, you're going to be multiplying the right-hand side, which was your identity matrix, by the inverse of e to the k, and then the inverse of e to the k minus 1, which is not shown here, all the way down until you get to e, uh, the inverse of e1. Now, remember, anytime we multiply any elementary matrix, or sorry, any matrix at all by the identity matrix, you get what you started with. So we don't actually need the identity matrix to be written there. And what does this show? Well, this shows that A is equal to the product of E1 inverse times E2 inverse times all the rest of those. And remember, the inverse of an elementary matrix is an elementary matrix. We proved that. So that shows what we were trying to prove in the first place. A can be expressed as a product of elementary matrices. Okay, This fact is really important, and it's what's going to ultimately lead us to uh, an algorithm for finding... Um, the inverse of a matrix. We're going to talk about that in the next video. But first we need to wrap up this theorem. The last thing we need to prove is that if we assume D in our equivalence theorem, it implies A. That is, if A can be expressed as a product of elementary matrices, that is going to imply that A is invertible. And this is very short. So if A is a product of elementary matrices, notice we reference a couple of theorems here, then the matrix a is a product of invertible matrices and hence is invertible. So the theorems that are being referenced here, this one, 1.4.7, is the one that said if uh, two matrices, A and B, are invertible, then their product is as well. That generalizes, though, to any product of inverses, which is not too hard to see why. So theorem 1.5.2 is the one that we just proved a little while ago that says that every elementary matrix is invertible. So basically what this means is if I can write A as a product of elementary matrices, which is the assumption that we're making, like this, then really, because all of these are invertible, A is the product of K invertible matrices, and any product of, of invertible matrices is invertible by that theorem that we just referenced. So that wraps up this equivalence theorem. And that's going to wrap up this video too. We'll go ahead and move on to the inversion algorithm in the next one.